David. So, uh, today we will talk about growth uh, and everything that implies uh, around your startup. First thing, I already said that so many times, but I need to repeat it again and again and again until you all are so like past this moment that you will hate me and at least you will have learned something. Startups equal growth. Like you can you can look for thousands of definitions of startups. You know, there is like so many debate about what is a startup, what is not a startup. Uh, is uh, like, for example, we hear so many times, oh, this company is not a startup, is not on the internet. No, a startup is not something that is on the internet. Uh, we hear so many times, oh, this is not a startup because there is no technology. No, there is some startup that don't have any technology. So, like, I think the most simple definition of what is a startup is startup equal growth. Because growth is a kind of a very structuring obsession around a company that is trying to be a startup. And that obsession will define who you are as a startup. Because startups become impressive when they achieve a level of growth that seems otherwise impossible to achieve. If you, if you want to be, like if you look at about, around us at all the big startups like Uber, for example, what is so impressive about Uber? For sure, not their mobile app. I mean, especially with a new logo. But like, what will be impressive about Uber is that they will double the number of drivers every six months. And that is really impressive. To imagine that Uber start, started only five years ago or six years ago and reached to a point where Uber now is, that seems so unique so impossible to replicate. And that's what really defines startup. And that's why the growth inside your company is the only thing that matters. At any price, and everything you do should always come down to that simple thing. Does what I'm doing will help my growth or not? If it helps your growth, if it helps your growth, you should do it. If it doesn't help your growth, you should not do it. So, just a disclaimer before starting. This is why startups are uncomfortable. You know, a lot of people say doing a startup is very hard. Uh, it asks a lot from yourself. Uh, it's very, very demanding. But for a very simple reason. It's because of growth. Because growth hurts. Like, you have to understand that this idea that you can plan your growth, take decision in advance, and be in a situation where you are comfortable with the growth you are trying to achieve is a dream. Like, if you want a common characteristic between every entrepreneur that are successful is that they are suffering from their growth. And suffering from a very, very personal cost. Because growth will cost your life, it will cost your time, sometime, and it's something we don't talk a lot about in the startup world, it will, it will cost your mental health, it will cost your, your, your physical health, because it's so demanding. You reach a level where everything is always so late inside your company that you have no other choice than working harder and harder. And by the way, like that's something I we love to track inside our portfolio is how much entrepreneurs are tired or not. Like you want a very single element of prediction of success, entrepreneurs that are really, really late. More like, you know, so many people try to evaluate startup by how good they look. You know, like they have this high definition of what a good company look like. Process that are very well done, a team that is recruited at the right time, everyone doing a specific job and specific task, blah, blah, blah. And if you look at every good startup, they are a mess. They are so chaotic. They are growing so fast that no one really knows what this job is about because everyone needs to do everything just to keep operation flowing. And that point and that situation is what makes startup incredible. 
because it's a kind of environment where you are growing so fast and so well that no rules from the external world and classical world of enterprise will apply. And that's why startups are so counterintuitive, because you need to do things that seems to be impossible to. So, why growth is so important? Because it's a single element of value creation. And there is something magical about growth, is that if you are growing, nothing that happens inside your company is important. No mistakes is hurtful as long as you are growing. And you know, like, there is this joke in Silicon Valley that I like a lot, is who run a company? It's very easy, if the company is growing, it's an entrepreneur. If the company is not growing, it's an investor. Because it gives you what matters. If a company is growing, investor will be like, okay, we should not say anything, because if we say anything, maybe we'll broke. So we will like be like, yeah, just keep doing what you are doing. And if you reach a level where you are not growing anymore, you are dead. Look at Zenefit, for example. Like, who knows here Zenefit? Because it's not a very famous company in Europe. So Zenefit is a company that is very young, I think, two years old, three years old, help me, yeah, something like that. For sure, no more than four years old, but I think more three years old than, than four years old. So, Zenefit is a HR solution that comes for free. It's a HR software that you manage all your human resources for free. And why they do that for free? Because they are able to sell you insurance and they act as an insurance broker. And because they act as an insurance broker, they do so much money that they have this kind of, you know, position where they are the most fast-growing SaaS in the history of Silicon Valley, going from zero to 12 million of annual recurring revenue in less than six months. So let's imagine you, you have an ID, you create a company, and six months later, you are doing 12 million euro in revenue annually, recurring. And they were supposed to reach the 100 million uh, step, like something like seven months or eight months after, after the fundraising. They fundraised more than $500 million. Because when you have this kind of numbers, the kind of money you can bring on table is unlimited. So what happened? They miss a milestone. So. You are doing benefits, you miss a milestone, what happened? You get fired. Because people poured 500 million on a forecast. And because it was supposed to grow. And so as soon as you get fired, everything you've done looks wrong. Oh, the company is a mess, there is no process, there is no accounting, there is no blah, blah, blah. And so if you look the letter of resignation wrote by the CFO that becomes the CEO. It's horrible. Like, I was so sad this week reading that. Like, I was like, what a jerk. Like, how can you go publicly and say that everything is wrong? By the way, you are the CFO, so you kind of have a responsibility around that too. But it's, it's so easy. And why? Because when growth stops, there is no one to protect you. Like, that's the deal. That's the deal you have with your startup. And that's a fine deal, by the way. Because it's a very binary game. You win, you will be on the winning side. You lose, you will be on the losing side. And that's not so obvious traditionally in economy. You know, like, we have so much industries that are losing and that's on the winner side because government protect them. Well, <laughs> you know what I mean. So, <laughs> so, so it's, it's very important to understand that growth is a single way to create value, and that value will solve every problem you have inside your company. There is a story I read in the Facebook effect. If you want to read a very beautiful book about the, the beginning of Facebook, I think the best book ever read, and it will be better than watching The Social Network, is The Facebook Effect. Uh, you can, it's, it's, it's very entertaining, it's uh, written very well, and it seems to be the most objective version of the beginning of Facebook. 
And there is a story I love in that book. It's a very small story. I think most of people did not notice it, but for me, it, it has been like uh, an illumination to read that. So when Facebook raised their first round, the average age inside the team was under 21. And that's a very important point in the in, in United States. Because under 21, you are not allowed to drink in the United States. So what do you do? Like you raise your first seed round, not a lot of money, $500,000. You take all the team, seven people, to Las Vegas to a party to celebrate that. And they drank so much in Las Vegas, being under 21. Then when they come back, one of the guys puke inside the climatization of the bus. And the AC broke, and the guarantee on, on, and the deposit on the truck, on the bus, was not enough. So they had to pay a fine of something like $25,000 or $30,000. So I let you imagine your first board meeting. So, where is the cash situation? So, we have to tell you, we spent 10% of our fundraising in a bus from Vegas, drinking alcohol, being under 21. So, you have two situations in that case. Situation one, you are number two on the market. And you are number two, so what happened? You, people will yell at you. You have a high risk of getting fired. And everything that comes around. But when you are Facebook, and that your number of users from the closing of the fundraising and the first board get multiplied by 10, you tell that story, and you know what the investor do? They say, okay, forget it, send me the bill personally, and I will pay it with my own money. You should not use the corporate money for that. You see the difference? That's a grow effect. And that's why also, sometimes in startups, some people tend to develop very irresponsible behavior. Because it's exactly like being a child that everyone always say yes to. You tend to develop a complex where you think that everything is granted. Until the time you don't grow anymore. So the funny thing about, about startup is that there will be always a moment where the growth will stop. Like if you are lucky enough to find your traction, if you are lucky enough to be in a position where you are growing and you, are, you have a lot of early success. I can tell you that one day, it can be soon or later, but one day your growth will stop, for sure. Because that's the problem with growth, is that growth comes with level. You know, when you look at, at level of growth, you always look like that, you know, perfect exponential. But the actual numbers is more like, Oh, you, you reach one step and you are flat for a few months and you understand why you are flat and you go to the second step so you are growing again and after you are flat again and things like that. So because of that situation, every time you will stop to grow, that's when you will be evaluate about your behavior, about your operation, about how the company is structured. So I'm not telling you just grow and do whatever fuck you want because it's like being a rock star. Like, being a rock star, you can do whatever you want until the day you are not a rock star anymore, and it's hard to change your behavior, and it's hard to change your life. That's what Mike Jagger say. <laughs> it's, it's so hard to, be, to come back to normal life. But I understand why, because when you get used to that kind of fashion and, and, and way, you, you, you have a problem. So, managing your growth, and especially managing the communication around your growth, is one of the most important things as an entrepreneur you will have to learn to. So what does it mean, managing growth? Managing growth means that at every step, you will find a new way, a new kind of investment to reach the next level of growth. And when I'm talking about managing growth, I want to give you a very simple idea in mind, is that every growth are created. I don't know where that idea comes from, but there is this very common idea outside that, you know, like the traditional path of doing a startup is that you have an ID, you talk with your friend about the ID, you tell people about the ID, and you are successful. You know, like that's, that, that's a single way everyone imagine outside. So some weird people say, I have an ID, I keep it secret and I will be successful, but the, 
that one is less and less common, but, but still. But the point there is that it's the idea that succeeding as a startup is about doing something perfect. And because you will do something perfect, everybody will recognize how perfect it is. And they will talk about to each other and it will grow. And you know, you have always that, like I love that because it's, it's so cute. It's when an entrepreneur come and pitch you and say, I just need that three people talk to three people that talk to three people and I will have a lot and lot of users. And it's true because after 12 levels, you have everybody on earth. So yeah, <laughs> it's, it's quite easy actually. You want everyone on, on earth, just find three people that talk to three people that talk to three people 12 times and you have everybody on earth. So why products don't grow like that? Because we are all lazy. Like, look how many products you use that you like and you never talk about to anyone. And even worse, take the list of products you love, you talk to everyone and no one use it. I think that's even worse to, to understand what happened in real life. So in graph theory, you know, there is a, there is a field in math that tried to study how a message get viral and what is a network is and how from a node to a node things go and flow. And in graph theory, that's what we call the resistance of a network. Is that for everyone that is convinced, you will have always people that are not. And having a key f k factor superior to one is so uncommon. And this is why you need a lot and lot and lot of manual labor. Take an example, how many times someone needs to get a message repeat to remember a message? You know, that's very traditional in advertising. You know why we see so many times the same ads? Because if, if people doing ads will be like entrepreneurs, they will, be, they will buy one perfect ad once, and they will hope that everyone talk about the ads. But that's not what they do. They do very shitty ads, because they don't know how to do good ads. And they market it so much and repeat so much that you reach a point where, like it or not like it, you will remember it. And that de depends on people, but it's between being front of a message between 15 times to 50 times. And so you imagine if you are with the worst, worst user on earth and it's 50 times, you need to repeat so many times to the same person before he get it. And it's horrible. Like, for example, I love that story because I'm very ashamed of that story. Is that one day I was in the office here and I yelled in the office, fuck, Voyage SNCF doesn't work. And everybody was like that. Like, are you kidding? Like, you are really using Voyage SNCF and not Captain Train? And I was like, uh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm investigating on Voyage SNCF, and uh, of course, I'm a deep user of Captain Train. I was, you don't imagine how ashamed I was feeling. Like, it's horrible. It's like if you forget the name of your kid, you know, like, who are you? Uh, my kid? Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> Very smooth. Like, it, it, it will be insane. That's the level of, of that mistake. And why? Because it's so hard to get something in mind. You know, you don't really think about it. You want to buy a train ticket. Even if you are talking about Captain Train all day long, because you are tired, you go on Voyage SNCF. So if that kind of things can happen at that level, imagine average user that don't have any emotional link to the company. Like, by the way, Jean-Daniel Guillaume did not talk to me for three months because he learned about that story. So it's, it's to tell you how, how big consequence can be around that. Let's take three cases that are very different in their growth management, that are at the family, and it will show you what managing growth is about. Save, trust, agricole. So I choose that three companies first because they are very good companies. And it's better to talk about the good companies than the bad, for sure. But also because they have very different growth constraints. So the first one is save. Save job is very easy. You broke your iPhone. You need to think about the fact that save can save you. So first, the name kind of help. Like, it's not a bad branding. Can be, like, just a, 
a little bit about that, pay attention about how you choose your name. Because entrepreneurs are so denial about that. You know, they choose horrible name and you try to play the, the writing test with it. You know, you, you, you tell someone, write that name and they write horrible. And you tell them, you see, it will never be vir viral. And they're like, no, <laughs> my user knows how to write it. So don't be in, de in denial. Like, take very simple names that people can remember and talk about. Because it's so stupid to don't have an opportunity to, have, to grow because no one can find you. Like, I, I think that's one of the, you know, the wars. We, we should do the ten, top 10 reasons to not growing. And that one, that one will be the first one. Like, yeah, I, 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 I love my name, so I'm, I'm not changing my name. So save is very, a very complicated company to scale because you are not broking your iPhone every day. You know, you can divide companies between companies with very common usage and companies with very uncommon usage. So how many f iPhones are broke every day? Millions around the, around the world. But the problem is that each user of iPhone broke his phone at maximum maybe once a year. Baltazar at the family, it's every month. But normal people, <laughs> normal people will do that once a year, twice a year. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure three times a year. It's a very common usage. So the problem is that as an entrepreneur, you will think stupid things like, oh, there is a high demand because millions of phones are broken outside. But you will not see that the problem is how you put yourself in front of these people and be in their mind at the time they need it because it happens so uncommonly. That's one of the worst situations to solve because growing products that have very rare usage are very complicated to grow. So where SAFE became so incredible is that they realize that most people with a broken iPhone stay with the broken iPhone and use it. And that's something like that is kind of interesting to analyze is how lazy we are. You know, it's, it, 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 we never imagine how much people have a high tolerance for things that is always much higher than any entrepreneur will imagine. Because if you look the view of an entrepreneur in that field, it will be like someone broke his iPhone. So it will go on Google and, and look for how to fix my iPhone. You know, that will be the traditional mindset about that problem. But that's not what it happened. Oh, fuck, I broke my phone. Oh, it's still working. <laughs> so you will, not, you will not be like, I, I need now to repair it. So thinking of that, the question was like, where can I put myself in front of people that will be like a big sign saying, you have a broken iPhone in your pocket, and I know it. And I can solve that very quick. So one of the first secrets of SAVE is that they invented methodology to repair iPhone fast. Why it's so important to repair iPhone fast? Because it's not a question of having the iPhone repair. It's a question of having a cost of repair that is very low. And not monetary cost, but opportunity cost. Because why no one thinks with a broken iPhone that he should broke his iPhone directly? It's because he wants to still use his iPhone. We are so dependent on the iPhone that there is no way we go and give it for three weeks. Like if you go to the, you know how many percent of people go on Genius Bar and they get as a reply, yeah, I can re fix the iPhone for free, it will take a month. You're like, what? Yeah, well, if you are rich, you buy a new iPhone. And if you are not rich, you are like, yeah, give me back my phone. Like, you want to take my baby a month? Like, are you serious? And, and it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because people need to have this ID that you will take the phone and repair it very fast. So you see, sometimes growing is about finding a sub problem, a problem inside the problem that no one saw. And if you can solve that sub problem, Every other problem on the chain of value will get solved. Because if you, have the, if you can convince people that you can repair iPhone very fast, you will be in a situation where people will start to think of you as a solution because you will solve the real problem is that 
I don't want to, to be out of my phone. So how do you get that message over internet? Like how do you put a message like that in mind of people? So hard. And that's where I think most entrepreneurs have a lack of imagination. Is that they think that their job is so caricatural around the kind of tools they have. So for example, you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to do something over the internet, so you will try to find solution over the internet for every problem. Where save have been genius is that they open fucking corners in supermarket. Why supermarket? Because you go to do your shopping, you let your phone for 40 minutes, you come back, you get it, it's repair. It's dead simple. But why it works? It works because it solves every problem on the chain of value. How to put it in mind of people? Just be aware they, they, they have an iPhone that is broken. So people get inside the shop with a broken iPhone. They see a sign telling them, during your shopping, we can repair the iPhone. So they go back and, and they put the iPhone and it will be repaired in 40 minutes instead of a few weeks. And that methodology, that's a scaling methodology. Why? Because now let's do a very simple calculation. Say they have, let's say they have 100, 100 shop, okay? So 100 corner in supermarket. And let's say in average, 10,000 people go in front of that corner a day in average yearly return. So 200 days in the year, that's a 2 million people. You imagine? Like, that will be so much people by corner that if you replicate that by, by 1,000 corner or 10,000 corner, you will have a marketing impact that no one can have on the market over the web. Because if you try to buy AdWords to replicate exactly the same thing, you will not solve the problem and you will be in a situation where you will never, never bootstrap your company. And where the company become great is that all these people that repair the iPhone and save and learn about the brand talk to their friends, and their friends can find over the internet about the shop, and they can get iPhone repair over internet. So you see how a physical thing can bootstrap something online, and the online come back to the physical thing that come back online. And why it's a startup? It's a startup because they achieve a level of opening a sh of shop that will seem impossible in traditional retails. Because what's the difference between save and traditional retails is that they are born over the internet. So every employees are in Slack. Uh, every software from the shipping management to the invoicing inside the shop to the management of the team is developed internally by the product team, etc., etc. So you will be in a situation where everything you do and everything you design will be think of a scale. If you look at traditional business, they will open one shop, try to be profitable, wait to be enough profitable to take the money and open a second shop. And it will be line linear. It will never be exponential. And you will never take profit of what growth provides. So what are the side effects of growth on a product like that? For example, last month, Save about so many units of screens and chips and things that no shop in France was able to do any repair for three weeks. That's called a corner. Because you reach a level of growth that is so fast, that costs so much. Because opening, like, Save now is opening one shop a day. You imagine? Every day, you have a new corner, and it will be soon two shop a day, and I think before the end of the year will be three shop a day. They went from 100,000 revenue a month to 100,000 revenue a day in a year. And they are hiring 2,000 people only in 2016. 2,000 people joining company in one year. That's what is called scaling. That's what is called growing. Because you put and you push so much at every level that it can broke and you can die at every corner. 
saying it. But if you survive, you are in a position where you will have a level and a size that will kill everyone on, on market. Because you will be so big that you will build a monopoly. Because when you will go and, and do your market to buy supply, no one can go around you. So another example is Trusk. So who know Tr Trusk? It's less no... Comp fuck hell. Uh, it's a good team. <laughs> so Trusk is seven weeks old. Just to, to... We don't really know how they do that. But So Trusk is, is about moving big things. Uh, you want to, I don't know, move a sofa, buy something from Ikea, um, do a moving from two apartments, having a big piano that you want to bring from an office to another. You call Trusk. It's a Uber for moving things. It's a very simple ID, I think. Thousands of people already had that ID. But what's the difference with, between Trusk and others? Is that Trusk have exactly the same problem that Uber, than, uh, sorry, exactly the same problem than Save, even worse. Because moving things is hard. But people that need to move things are very uncommon. We all need to move things once a year or twice a year, but it's not like we are moving things all day long, all the time, like, yeah, I will buy a new sofa every day because Trusk exists. Like, you will not have this kind of retention. How do you get inside the mind of people? It's very easy. Like, you have two choices. Choice one, you try to find a way, like, on internet again to scale. But you will have the problem that everyone have over internet, is that it's so hard to get notice. I don't know why entrepreneurs are so obsessed about doing apps do, that no one will download, or doing websites that no one will look at, or doing things like, if you talk to 95% of entrepreneurs that come to pitch us, it's always the same story. Is I'm doing an app, I'm doing a website, I'm doing things, I'm doing A, and it's always the same, how you will get people on it. Yeah, I will do it and we will come. So no, you don't do it and no one come because no one care. And if you don't realize that very deeply in your heart, you will never be able to go to the next stage. So if you are someone like Trusk, you will struggle for growth. Like the first five weeks or four weeks of Trusk have been horrible because they was all day long calling people on Le Bon Coin. So how they do, they look on Le Bon Coin, they take their phone and they say, oh, I see that you are selling a sofa on Le Bon Coin. How you will deliver it? Uh, I don't really know. Like, the guy will pick it. We have the solution. We are Trusk. Beep, beep, beep. Like, <laughs> like, you have to imagine that people that are selling things on Le Bon Coin, even if Trusk can save their life, they, they, don't, they don't really care. So Trusk understands that the problem was not on the sell side. It was on the buy side. Because people that really need to get around uh, the, the buying thing, is, the people that need really to move things are not so much the people that sell, because when you are on Le Bon Coin, people say, yeah, come pick it. But it's the people that buy it. So how do you get in the mind of the people that buy? They did a plugin that goes on Le Bon Coin, and it's, it's a Chrome plugin. And so when you look at an, an, an ad on Le Bon Coin, it tells you how much it costs to get, to get it delivered to you. And so making for buyer their life very easy to compare between products just based on cost of delivery. You see how you reverse something? And so how do you get that installed by people? By being very, very aggressive around ads. So, one of the things that is great about Trusk is that they are very good at doing viral videos. They have all this, like you can go on Trusk fan page on Facebook and you will see. They have some videos that reach 8 million people. I, they are so good at that. And what they do is that they do a lot of funny video that send on this plugin and that plugin send back to the Trusk website and Trusk is growing thanks to that. So you see, sometimes managing growth is about piggybacking yourself on someone that already have the clients. If you can find a way, like if you have a, a huge concentration of user at some point, it will be good to piggyback yourself on them and try to find a way to, to convince people very rationally 
that you are the good solution for the f usage we have on the website. And the goal for any company like that, it's to reach a tipping point of awareness. And that tipping point will be a point where everyone, everyone will know Trusk and it will become something everybody has in mind. But you don't become that without working very hard and very, very manually. Like if you want a good image about what the work involves of launching a startup, think about a, you know, a car that you have to manually launch. It's, it's so tough, like because you need to reach a level of, of speed where, where the en engine will you know, just start and work by itself. Doing a startup is exactly the same thing. You need to reach that level and you need to reach it fast. The last example is AgriCool. I love AgriCool. You can go and, and look at agricool.co. It's the first strawberry company in containers, doing strawberries with 90% less water, a clean energy all year long. It's the best strawberry you ever had, and it's coming from an expert in strawberry, I can tell you. Uh, and, and the funny thing with AgriCool is that that's the kind of company where you need to grow before having anything. Because that's the problem with all these company is that they want to change something in the world that is so hard to change that they need to be successful before delivering anything. Like, if you are agricole and you think the traditional way of doing agricole, what will be the traditional way? The traditional way, you will build a container and you will have strawberry and you will try to sell that strawberry every day and you will show that on one container, it works, and the model works. The problem is that it cannot work on one container. There is a lot of technical reason for that, and one of them is because you need a lot and lot of R&D. So if you do only your R&D on one container, you cannot paralyze experience. So like, let's say you have 10 containers, and strawberry takes four weeks to grow. If you do one experience on one container, you can do one experience every four weeks. But if you have 10 containers, you can do 10 different experiments every four weeks. So you get why you need many containers at the beginning to achieve the kind of experience you need to produce a lot of strawberry because you need to discover a lot of things by trial and fail. And that's why doing a company like Agricool is hard. So Agricool is in this category of company that are very uncommon, that is called capital intensive. You need to fundraise between five to 10 million on day first just to launch. So two choice. Choice one, you will write a business plan and you will do a simulation of a containers and you will go and pitch every investor on earth and in five years, maybe you will get a million. Because it looks crazy. Like imagine someone come and tell you, I will make strawberry in containers and provide strawberry worldwide. You will be like, yeah, sure. But why AgriCool is magical? Because they bring people to the container, people try a strawberry, and there is a before and after. Everyone that tries try an AgriCool strawberry is so excited. So what you do? You hack your process, you hack your growth. You understand that you are, will not grow linearly, but you will grow by step. And at every step, you have a very simple KPI to achieve. And the first KPI to achieve for, for AgriCool have been to have 20,000 people that want to try the strawberry. There is 20,000 people that are waiting for strawberry in Paris. 20,000 people waiting for something is a lot. So what you do, you take that and you go to the city hall and you tell them, I need one place to put my first container. And you build your first container. And you don't try to build a container that will be your final container, but you build a container that will produce enough strawberry for demonstration. And that's where it becomes easy. Because if you want to build a container that will be real container, you need a lot of R&D. But building a container that will produce 20 or 30 very good strawberry every cycle, it's enough. So you take out every good strawberry and you made, you, it's, it's, it's a 30 occasion to pitch. 
So you bring 30 people, you put them in the mouth, and you say, yeah, there is only one strawberry for you. And people have a, such an experience that they go and talk about it. And you see, like sometimes managing your growth is about understanding like a chess player that you need to sacrifice something to achieve a better chess mate. If you are agri cool and you are obsessed by R&D at first, it will not work. You, will, you need to convince people that the sorbery are good first. That's your first goal, not scaling. So if you are obsessed about growth, you need to grow not in real life, but online. And this is why AgriCool is doing, again, the website for the third time, because they try to be a phenomena before having any reality, because that will, like, you know, it's called fake it until make it. It's one of our favorite strategy at the family. It's because you will put everyone starting with the dream. So let me tell you a story. Uh, before yesterday, I had a dinner with one of the top 10 executives at Apple. And it was one of the best dinner in my life. I, I'm really grateful. Like, you know, one of the funny thing of doing what I'm doing is this kind of shit. Because you meet people that otherwise you will never have the level to meet. And I ask him that question. Why Apple is so successful? Like, why, what makes Apple so unique? And, you know, I, I don't know you, but me, I'm always a bit jealous when I think about Apple because I'm like, how it's possible? Like, how it's possible to do things that suck so much, like iTunes? Really, like, iTunes is... I don't know a product that is more horrible than iTunes on my computer. But you are in Monopoly, and everybody loves you, and what you are doing is amazing. Like, how can you manage such a mismatch between what you are, what you pretend that you are, and what people think you are? You know, like, it's not, at Apple, nothing aligns. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying that I'm a very big fan. Like, I have two iPhone, one iMac, uh, one fucking Apple Watch that I never <laughs> wear. <laughs> like, everyone that bought an Apple Watch. You know, it's kind of charity for Apple. Yeah, they launch a product, let's buy it and never use it. Uh, so, how that is possible? And he made me an answer that I will not imagine. He told me because Apple is the only company on Earth that is dream-driven. Everything at Apple starts by a dream. Like, they have a so clear definition of a dream. They dream so high, so big, that people are kind of illuminated by the dream they, they have. And the dreams are so beautifully expressed in such a light that even when they do Apple Music, it looks revolutionary. It's called Spotify seven years late. But it's a dream. And that's the power of Apple. And I think most startups underestimate that power. Why AgriCool is such a growing and successful company at the family without achieving yet anything? It's because their dream is so big. They want to change the way we eat on Earth. Like, what do you want as a bigger dream than that? And I think that most entrepreneurs have a lack of intensity about the kind of dream they try to have. You know, when you talk with Damien Morin from Save and you tell him what you are doing, I, I think the boring answer will be I repair iPhone and take a 20% margin on every reparation. But when you talk to him, he says shit's like, I want to save every device on Earth. That's big. Like, it's so big that it's impossible. Like, like there is so many markets where save will never go and fail to go. And I'm sure that if you hear me saying that, he will laugh. He will say, no, you will see, we will do it. Because he's fucking crazy. And, and because he has this kind of mindset that is out of reality and out of touch, that is doing big things. And if you want an advice, by the way, like a lot of people ask themselves if they should be an entrepreneur or working for an entrepreneur, it should be dream driven. Like you should think like, I am the kind of people that dream big or should I be the kind of people that work for someone that dream big? And, and, and that thing like it, it really illuminate me and why it's linked to growth. Because if you dream big, you will see that you need to grow fast. And there is only one way to grow fast, 
is to push and push and push to a point where it seems impossible. You will be always, always doing things that it seems impossible to do. And that is scary. You know, one of the stories from Save is that at the beginning of Save, they had something like five shops, and they decided to open five more. And Damien gets scared, really scared. Like, he was like, really, we had opened five in a month. Like, if we do five more, we will die. We have not the cash. We are not sure it works, and blah, blah. And the co-founder of Save, that no one ever talked in the press, but is as amazing as Damien, is called Cyril. Cyril told Damien that sentence that I will never forget. Until now, he was walking. Now we will start to run. And it was like really a kind of, you know, a satisfaction from education point of view that someone was ready to med his company in a situation where the company can die. Because that's what no one tell you about the growth thing, is that growing at that level and growing so fast is always something that can put your company in a situation where you can die. And if at every step you don't have the risk of dying, it's because you are not growing fast enough. So the growth is very important. And one of the things that will make no one growing fast is having a plan. You know why? Because people always believe their plan. If you tell yourself, I will do something in six months, it will, by chance, always take you six months or more. You should, like, if we was not, you know, like if plan doesn't have an influence on our psychology, people will say, I will do that in six months, and the week after it will be done. But look around you, that never happened. What happened is that if you tell yourself, I will do something in six months, it always takes six months. And maybe more, by the way, because we, we are bad with plan and bad with deadline, and so we will just proc procrastinate and we'll go to, to, to add time and time and time. So people that want to grow very fast, they never think in terms of timeline. They always think in terms of milestone. So what is the difference? The difference will be to never think about your company in terms of time-based milestone, but always to think in terms of KPI-based milestone. So if you are safe, the worst way to, 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 to plan yourself will be, I will open 1,000 shops in a year. That is bad way. If you think in terms of KPI, you will say, I will fundraise when I will have 100 shops open, and so I will try to open the 100 shop as fast as possible. And if I can do it in a month, I will do it in a month. If I cannot, I will do it in two months and three months. But whatever time it will take, my goal is to get 100 shop to, to, to test myself and to go to the next step. So another example will be like so many people start the company and say, I will do a beta for three months. And I will get out of beta in three months and launch the final product. And when the final product will be launched, I will fundraise. So they think that everyone outside uh, is waiting for them. You know, like, yeah, oh, you, you launched three months ago. Congratulations, you can fundraise now. So the good way to, to, to do that will be, I will be in beta until I get 10,000 users. And that can take a week or a month or a year. I have no idea. I will just try to do it as fast as possible. And when I will reach 10,000 users, I will think that the product is fine enough, so I will fundraise. You see, it's a total different mindset. Because in that case, your goal will be to put yourself in a position where you will be in a situation that the only thing that matters for you is how can you reduce your time frame and how can you reduce the time it takes to do things. I think the most crazy story about that is Uber launching team, because you know, Uber, when they launch a new city, they have a dedicated team doing that. They have a team that go from a city to another city just to open cities. By the way, it's one of the best ideas ever, because traditionally in business, 
you will do, for example, San Francisco, and you want to open New York, so you will hire a team in New York, and their learning curve will always go from zero, because they will <laughs> need to learn what it takes to launch a, launch a city. Uber did the opposite. Uber said, the team that launched San Francisco will go to New York, and we will find someone to manage San Francisco, because it's much easier to manage something that is successful than launching something. And so when you go to San Francisco or to New York, you already have the experience of having launching San Francisco. So you will do it faster and you will go to Chicago and you will go to Paris and you will go to London. And even if there is things that are specific to the city, there will be always things that are so common that you become an expert. And you know, it's again the story of riding a bike that I always, always talk about. If you talk with the people that launch city at Uber, like the head of launching worldwide, she's 26. She was an intern at Uber, and she's one of the most important executives. It's an incredible woman. And when you talk to her, you don't get anything. Like, like I, I read so many interviews, and you are like, yeah, she doesn't have any idea of why it works. Because it became so natural that she cannot really explain what happened. And we have all these processes that are counterintuitive, that only the people in that team understand, and we become so good. So why I'm telling you that, that story? If we do here a brainstorm about how fast the city can open, like, let's do that. How f like, who thinks it's possible to launch a city uh, in less than two weeks? Okay, raise your hand up. Okay, now, who thinks that it's possible? Stay, stay, stay raised, because that's the exercise. Who thinks that we can raise a city in less than a week? Okay? And who thinks that we can launch a city in less than three days? Really? You think that? You think that we can launch a city in less than three days? You are not funny. So, <laughs> you see it coming. Uber now is able to launch a city in three days. Let, let's imagine you are doing a meeting at Uber headquarters and you are doing a plan. And you are doing a plan about how long it should take to open a city. Do you sincerely think that anyone in the room will believe that it's possible to do it in three days? It will seem totally nuts. Like three days? Impossible. But when you did it every year for five years and you became so good at process, at standardizing things, at software, at payment, at blah, 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 that you build an infrastructure where you discover how fast it's possible to do it. And that's when a company becomes magical. It's when they do things that it's not possible to do. Exactly the same thing when opening a new shop every day. If you talk to any, any expert in, in retail, they will tell you that it's, it's impossible. And that's the point. The point is that in a startup, growing is about doing things that are totally outliners. Growing fast is about finding secrets that you put your psychology in a set where you put yourself in a position where you can find things that are impossible to do and it becomes natural because you discover secrets about the market that no one will ever discover because no one will have ever push to that level. And it will cost. It will cost money, it will cost energy, it will cost a lot of things. So, what is the first problem with growth is that because it costs, the first source of fear from growth are investors. Why? Because no investors in Europe are used to lose a lot of money very fast in a growing situation. Because they don't have a lot of money first, so they cannot, like that's, that's the biggest single problem in Europe in venture is that funds are so small but if you tell someone that they, you will spend their 15 million in six months, they will be like, yeah, and what we do after? I have no money to put more. So you need to learn to put yourself in a situation where you will ignore advice from your investors if they are not the kind of investor that like to grow aggressively. And you need to put yourself in a position where you can find the money you need from any source possible just to achieve that kind of level, because if you don't do that, you will end up like every, you know, for example, a local taxi company that don't understand why Uber is so big. 
Because even if they had the idea of Uber before Uber, Uber is the only one that grow, and when you grow that much, you become kind of a monopoly, a driver monopoly, a car monopoly, and things like that. So, again, if you play it well, and if you grow well, you will have the control over your destiny. More you understand your growth, more you will be in charge of your own company, because no one will ever want to stop that. You know, companies stop to think about how to get managed and how to get optimized when they stop to grow. And there is always a day where they stop to go and they need to become adult. So actually it works a little bit like when you're a kid. As when you are growing, no one really care about what you will be. And as soon as you stop to grow biologically, people start to be worried about you and think that you should do something in your life. Same thing with startups. As long as they grow, no one cares because it's natural, they need to eat a lot, they need a lot of money because they are growing and they are becoming bigger than anyone will have think. But as soon as they are at that level, there will be no, no one to, to be scared. And that's where the fear of death starts. The biggest problem with startup is that there is a misalignment between every stakeholders level of risk. So that's something you really need to understand is that every stakeholders inside your company will have a certain tolerance to risk. So let's, let's be funny. If you take your banker, their level of risk taking will be at zero. Uh, if you take your landlord, uh, and the guy that rents your office, like he will need to believe that your risk is below zero. But if you are talking to, I don't know, an intern, uh, their level of risk will be infinite because they don't care. Like, you, you know, we noticed that is that like good companies attract people that are not scared to lose their job. Bad companies attract a lot of people that need the job. So because they need the job, because they are bad, they will make the company even more bad because it creates a cycle of fear. But when a company is great, they attract people that can do anything. If you look at the family, you can take anyone working at the family and it can work anywhere else. Like no one, no one in our team is fear of unemployment. Like even, even people in our operations receive hundreds of offers a month to go to work for them. Like even, like even our cleaning lady receive every month an offer to get higher because people find that it's very clean here and she's kind of magical. So like it, it's to show you that when, when you have success, it creates a kind of glow around your employees at every level and people are very under, under hunting to get a better salary, a better opportunity and things like that. So, how, like, if you look at the fear of death, it's one of the points that makes every company at a, at a moment that will be in a situation where they will start to think twice before doing something. Uh, a good example of that is that more a company become profitable, more it's, it is risky to invest the profit in a new venture. If you take some, a company like Apple, like they have so much profit, but they don't do anything with it. Why? Because first, I think they don't care, but obviously also because they have a fear of death. And more than any company, they have been so close to death, that until today, there is still this feeling that everything can go wrong, so they need to save. And that's what you need to go against in your startup. Because as a startup, the fear of death is the most dangerous thing you can face. Because you will be in a situation where if you don't realize that at every step you can die, you will never do something magical and something that will be considered as impossible. So it's part of the job to fail, it's part of the job to get bankrupt, it's part of the job that everything goes wrong. 
So most of the time, the first easy growth to start is the short-term growth. Because everybody is thinking about growth hacking, blah, blah, blah. And I think we have a huge responsibility around that. Uh, but like, I try at every growth hacking conference to put a disclaimer. Growth hacking is for very growth company. Like you don't growth hack something that is at zero because growth hacking is a kind of a catalyze. You don't catalyze something that don't exist. You need first a chemical interaction and then you catalyze it. If you catalyze something where no chemical reaction, where there is no chemical reaction, you will never get anything. So forget any big plan for your first 1,000 customer and focus on doing things manually to learn. Like, I don't know how much time that we need to repeat it, and I don't know why people don't want to do it. I have my theories because it's boring. Like, so many people, they want to do their startup, they want to have fun. And doing growth hacking is fun because you look smart. And of course, going in the street and try to convince people, it's not fun. You look dumb. But it's the only way to do it. There is no other way. Like, short-term growth is manual, always manual. I will, I will tell you a story that I love. It's my friend in Silicon Valley. So he has that company that build a, a patent tracker. So you know when you have a patent and you need to protect your patent, you need to track any claim that come around the patent. So some companies, so usually you pay a law firm a very expensive amount of money so they can pay an intern a very low level of money to go on the website every day and check if there is claim. There is some genius that had this idea to say, let's do a software to do that. So the problem is that the YPO, like the uh, International Patent Office, they don't like to have the website crawled. So they, do, they put CAPTCHA on the website to check that the page is looked at by humans. And if you look every company that is trying to hack the CAPTCHA, they hire engineers that will find a way to crack the CAPTCHA. And because YPO have nothing else to do in their life, they change the CAPTCHA every month. So you have this like, uh, you know, mouse and cat run between the CAPTCHA maker and the CAPTCHA breaker. And Patent Safari was the best technology at breaking CAPTCHA. Like, the guy had these two engineers that have been so genius that they sent every CAPTCHA on Amazon, Amazon Mechanical Turk. So there was a CAPTCHA appearing, an iframe, a Indian was paid one cent to put the CAPTCHA, and the CAPTCHA was solved, and they were telling everyone that that is their technology. And so everyone was spending millions of dollars when they are just spending hundreds of dollars. And, the, and, and it was so funny to watch as a game. Why? Because they are smart. And the others are not smart, obviously. But also they are obsessed by doing things well. Another example that I saw recently is Mattermarks against Traxen. So Mattermarks is a company that try to analyze data for private equities company around the world. So you will put the name of a startup and it will tell you all the data you, uh, you have about the startup. And it's a costly product, it costs 12,000 a year, but when you are an investor, you need that kind of intelligence to watch competitors, to watch fundraising, to watch things. And Mattermark is an incredible team of PhD and data scientists and blah, blah, blah. Traxen hired 800 Indians in a year, calling every startup in the, in the world and putting the data by end. The quality of tracks and data is so high and Mattermark is so low because solving that problem on the computer science side is so hard. But having 800, I am not kidding, they hired 800 people in India that call all day long. And you know what is crazy? Is that they talk so much about one specific segment. For example, I was wondering about where each can launch in other countries of Europe. So I called the analyst that is doing all day long, like Uberpop and each competitor around the world. 
And I took it four hours with the guy, and the guy was like so good. Like I was like amazed. He, he knows every numbers, everything about everything, and and it was costing like something twenty five dollars an hour to talk to him. And you are like, my God, Paul Mattermark. Like, how do you want that a computer be better than that in in the short term? It's impossible. So sometimes you just need to be dead simple, and you just need to be good at being that simple. And that's what is hard with the short-term growth, is that most of the time people don't realize that it's just a question of yourself putting your community out. For example, so many B2C companies at the family never have any of their friends using it. It's so weird. I, I, don't, I never get den denial. I don't get that. I don't get how people can look to your face and explain that they are doing growth hacking when no one around them is using what they are doing. Like, for example, we had this company that was doing a, a messaging app. And I was like, yeah, you are using the messaging app with your friends. No, we are using WhatsApp. OK? So how you will convince users? Oh, we are planning to fundraise 5 million to buy ads. Yeah, sure, please, fundraise. Yeah, make it rain, guys. I don't know, it's weird. Like, you are doing a messaging app that anyone can use. It means that everybody around you should use it. And you should use that as an argument. And if no one around you use it, you should tell yourself, oh my god, it's first a bad idea, or maybe a bad product, or maybe a bad execution, or I did not get something. But you cannot go and pitch people like us and tell, I need to fundraise to buy ads because we did not start any communication. Like my favorite sentence ever. Yeah, we worked it so hard, but we never did communication. Never told someone that. Never did, like it's, it's like coming to a club, a sport of club and say, I'm a champion, I never did any sport. So when I will start, I will be so good. No, like when you will start, it will hurt, like everyone. And I can tell you when it's about sports. <laughs> so that manual growth, of course, has its limits. You will always reach a point where you will not be able to keep growing manually. Like if you look at that Indian company that is having 800 employees around, around the world, around India, they cannot grow to 8 million people calling every company on earth. Like there is a level where they will have to stop and develop software and scale because like you cannot grow like that forever. But until you reach that point, until you reach the level where it's not possible to do things manually anymore, you will be try it will be the point where you will start to find automatic solution growth hacking, uh, marketing, developing things like that. So the only way to know if you reach that level or not is to track your metrics. And you should try to never add any metric goal that is not relative. So let me explain you that. It's impossible to know if you are growing well or not in absolute numbers. And there is a sentence I always uh, tell my startups is that benchmark is for losers. Only losers compare themselves to others because that's such loser attitude. Because if everyone is bad in your industry, how do you feel to be less bad than everyone? It should never be a satisfaction. You should be like, okay, I will push every day to be better. And so it comes down to the view about metrics. So many people, for example, especially in e-commerce, you know, there are so many people in e-commerce that come and tell you, oh, I have 1.5% conversion, and the average in my segment is 0 0.9, so I'm doing 50% better. Yeah, or everyone is bad, and you are not doing 50% better, it's just that you are more lucky. If you are doing 1.5% conversion, your only goal should be every week, how I can increase that from 1.5% or to 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9. And you should never stop. Like we saw companies like that, for example, we told people, look, you will focus on your conversion rate and you will not stop until you reach 50% conversion rate. 
Like we love to do that kind of joke with entrepreneurs. Because when we say that, we know in our head that it's impossible to reach that. Like no one reached 50%. Until the day, you have people that reach 60%. And they will never add reach 60% if they have benchmarked themselves. And you discover things like, what? You put a picture of your team on home page and increase conversion? You're like, what? Okay, let's put team picture on every page. Everyone increase conversion. And that's how you discover new things. Because you never tell in your mind that something is impossible. And you don't imagine how much we are good at putting psychological limits around growth. This is why you need to work against that by having a view of the world that is just about small improvement. If you come and you say, okay, my goal is to reach 20% conversion, and you're at one, you will be depressed. Even if it's a benchmark. Because you will not start as big as a benchmark, and you will have psychological impact. So the methodology we have at the family is called up or out. So it's very easy. You look at your metrics on first week very naturally. So you launch a product, you look at how many users you have, what conversion rate you have, and whatever you have. And you tell yourself that every metrics will grow a little bit week of a week, and you just try to push. That's it. Whatever level you start. Because even, look, even if you start with one customer, and you are growing 10% a week of a year, you will have at the end of the year half a thousand customer. If you do that for a second year, after a year, you will have around 50,000 customer. And if you do that, year over year, again, kind of difficult, but you will be around 500,000 users or customers. So you see, like small numbers growing week over week with consistency can become really, really big. In the opposite way, if you benchmark yourself and if you say, oh, people have that amount, like imagine you are Facebook and you benchmark. And you say, the biggest social network on earth have 100 million users. You reach 100 million users. What do you do? You stop? Say, yeah, cool. We can go in holiday. We are the leader. No, you say, let's go to 500 million. Let's go to 1 billion. Let's go for 1.8 billion. And even now, let's go for 6 billion. And you have some problem with India. So that's, that's, another, that's another issue. Around all the metrics that need to grow, again, there is one metric that we love to call the life metric. In 99% of the cases, it's the revenue. A company is here to make money, and you need to have your revenue growing. Like, people that tell me, I focus on growth, not on my revenue, they need to explain where this sentence is coming from. Like, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm focusing on cake, so I don't eat chocolate. What? <laughs> there is no logical link between both. Like, the, the logical link is because you are growing that your revenue is growing. There is a natural relationship between your revenue and your growth. First thing, because revenue is the heart of your company. Second thing, because more revenue, more means to grow. So at the moment, growth costs. So if you don't have money to grow, you will not grow. So <coughs> there is this very organic relationship that, that, that you, you need to understand. So, I will do it that way. There is three levels of metrics. There is vanity metrics, optimization metrics, and life metrics. Vanity metrics are totally unuseful metrics, and they are all the metrics that doesn't have any impact on your life metric. A very simple example, if you, have a, if you are a social network, the number of people that subscribe doesn't have any impact on if you are alive or not. Why? Because what counts on a social network is how many people you keep. Retention is much more important than acquisition. Because naturally on a social network, if people use a social network, the social network grow. Because if someone does social interaction, of course, the number of users 
grow. But the number of users can grow without social interaction because they get tricked. So the vanity metric will be number of users subscribe. The optimization metric will be how many daily active users. How many users in my user base are using the app every day? For example, the company that I'm so amazed by is Facebook. Because Facebook is so tough as a company that they decided to, to, to merge the vanity metric and the optimization metric. You know, Facebook never gave any number of the number of users if it doesn't mean monthly active user. You know, when Facebook say, we'll reach 100 million people, we'll reach 200 million people, we'll reach 1 billion people, it means that they reach the level of monthly active user, and no one inside the company was able to know how many people subscribe. Because there is so much fake accounts. Like, if Facebook wanted to look that they are growing faster than they are, they will just publish the vanity metrics and it will be true. We will have that amount of subscribers and people will be like, yeah, but there is a lot of fake account. That's true. And that's why the fake account criticism never worked on Facebook. Because Facebook never communicate on anything else than the monthly active users. Because of that, you have this optimization metrics that are so important because the optimization metrics are what will produce the life metrics. So the life metrics is just a consequence that every optimization metrics works. So the problem is that it's a big job to build your optimization metrics uh, dashboard. The most easy business to do that is SaaS company. You know, service, um, uh, every service uh, subscription as a service company, they have incredible software as a service, sorry, SaaS. Uh, all these companies have so much documentation online about every optimization KPI and what to track to order to succeed. Every other business doesn't have that. And for example, at the family, we are working on trying to take every vertical and build an optimization dashboard that is standard. It's so hard. We are working on that from a year, and I think we have one board that works. And we did not publish it yet because actually after test it doesn't work. So the problem is that it's very complicated to build a standard, a standard dashboard around your company. So it's your job to understand what will be every optimization at every step that you need to achieve to reach a level where you can be sure that what you are doing works. And you need to be very focused on the time scale you are measuring things. It should be not more than the week. Like the best thing will be a day, but I know a day it's hard. It's, you know, every day are not equal and there's a lot of variation day from day and, and it can be depressing to look at day. But even if it's depressing, it's not bad. But if you look at week, it works so well. Um, I read that article this morning about how to read more books over the year. And you know, it's all this life hack bullshit thing like, yeah, I, 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 I track my life and I, I did 10 minutes more reading, blah, blah. And, and the answer was so stupid. It was like, I read a page a day. Because one page a day, it's 350 page, 365 page after a year, and 365 page when you read small books, like that's a lot, it's three or four books. So if you don't read any books, it's a good start. But you see, it's stupid. It doesn't need to be very smart. Like, if you do things on a short time frame, you will have big effect over the long term. If you try to do big things, of a big time frame, you will get depressed. Because you will never be able to see if it works or doesn't work, and you will never understand if you are succeeding or not. By the way, and I need to say that very clearly, I should even have done a graph of that. When we are talking about growth rate, week over week, we are talking about absolute numbers. 
not cumulative numbers. You don't imagine how many people show us decks and saying, we grow 49% week over week. Uh, you had 200 customers on first week, and you have 212 customers on last week. Yeah, but we went from zero to 10,000. No, 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 you don't get it. That's not growth rate. That's, abs that's cumulative rate. In cumulative numbers, every company go up. Because every week you have more numbers, even if it's lower, it will go up. Because A plus B equal more than A alone. So it, it's, it's, it's something I, you have to understand that growth is about the fact that the next week you do more in absolute numbers than the week before. And when we say you should grow at 10% a week, for example, it means that if you had 100 customers in the first week, you should have 110, meaning that the total number of users will be 210, meaning that in cumulative growth, that's more than 110%. You, you see where I'm going? So we are talking about growth rate, not, not, not relative numbers. So the only way to do that is to have a very clear ambition about where you want to go. And you need to be very clear inside the team about the level of ambition. And it works the two way around, meaning that everybody in your team should be depressed if you don't reach your growth level. And I don't see, like, you know, the problem with most entrepreneurs is that they don't celebrate the right thing. And it's very important to learn what to celebrate inside your company. But in the same time, they don't share the right desperation. Like, for example, you will, say, you will tell the company at the family that you should grow at 10% a week to make it easy. Okay, 10% a week, by the way, is a lot. It will be more five or seven, but let's say 10%. And the company will not reach that level. The first common intuition to every good funders will be to don't tell anyone because they are nice. They don't want to send an email and say we failed as a team. But that's exactly what you should do. And it's hard, but one of the things as an entrepreneur that you need to learn is to communicate every news in a very transparent way internally. So for example, one of the advice we give to every entrepreneur is to do an automatic email with the growth in Slack or by email. So you will put a software, like for example, you can do that in Google Analytics, you can do that in Stripe, you can do that in PayPal, that will just send the numbers with the result and you cannot stop it. You know, you cannot be, oh my God, this week is not bad, I will try to, to put a bug. You, you should, it should be automatic and everyone in the team should receive it. And it will be kind of a collective acknowledgement of the performance of the company. And it works in both ways. You know, you can, you can, there is this article in New York Times that I love, that it's called, when you lose, you should not have ice cream. It's, it's a writer in New York Times that said that when he was a kid and he was playing baseball, he got an ice cream when he win. And if he lose a match, it did not never got ice cream. And now you got an ice cream because you win, and you got an ice cream because you lose. Because it's a way to cheer you up because you lose a match. Because what is important is not winning, it's to participate. So this fucking conservative guy was like wanted to have a startup mindset with children. So like as as soon as possible, you need, you're a loser. You you lose the match. Okay. I'm not saying that that's the way we should raise children, but I'm saying that at least if we don't raise children like that anymore, you should not raise your employee and your startup that way. You should be harsh. You should be harsh with yourself, you should be harsh with your team, and you should be very clear about what success means and what failure means, and it should be external, KPI-driven, and it should be week over week. If not, People will be surprised because one day you will come and say, oh, we failed our fundraising and every employee will be like, why? Why did we fail? Because you are bad at pitch, because blah, blah. And it will create trouble that are unnecessary. If everyone inside the team is aware 
that something is not going well, they will work hard to make it well. And by the way, they will work harder than you most of the time because they don't have your pressure. You know, for a founder company that fell, it's a lot of pressure. For most employees, it's, yeah, it's, it's sad for the guy, but, but I have a salary and I will do something else in my life. So it's not such a big deal. So they are more free to find solution, to give suggestion, to go, to go far. So that's for me a very good moment to talk about one of my favorite story. It's called Iliad. So who read the Iliad, by the way? Okay, cool. Uh, so for the one that did not read it, uh, it's a very simple story. You have a very beautiful girl that gets in love for a nice guy. Uh, and the guy took the girl back to his home, so the husband of the girl is unhappy, of course. So he built a big army and he wants to go and fight back <laughs> against the guy that took his woman. And it's called uh, Troy, uh, Troy War. There is a very good movie, by the way, with Brad Pitt in, in, inside, and Brad Pitt is awesome, so only for that you can, you can watch it. Uh, <coughs> and especially in this movie, he has like that kind of very violent charm, and it's is, 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 is a very impressive movie. I know a lot of people think that it's not historically accurate, but that's the point with a fiction book, is that you can do whatever you want, because it's not history. Uh, and in that movie and that book, there is one moment that has been an obsession in my life. It's called the Akil Dilemma. So what is the Akil Dilemma? Akil doesn't want to go to the war because he's, he, he has a nice girlfriend and he's living in a city where there is nice and fresh water, sunlight, beach, and he's like, why, why on earth I will go to the war? So like every good boy on earth, he goes and talks to his mom and asks his mom, what should I do, mom? Like, should I go to the war or should I not? And the mom say, it's very easy, simple choice. You need to choose between glory or happiness. You cannot have both. So if you are on the happiness path, stay here. You will have a children. Your children will love you. Your grandchildren will respect you. Your grand-grandchildren will somehow know who you are. But after that, no one will remember you. If you go to the war, it will be hard. You will not have children. You will die there, my son, and you will not come back. But one day, Usama will speak on stage about you. And that will be glory. So that dilemma is a dilemma anyone that wants to do something with his life have. And I think people don't think enough about that dilemma. Because most of the people choose between glory or happiness by default. You know, they don't really think about it and they are like, yeah, I should do a startup because that's what people do. And by the way, if you want a, a psychological difference between entrepreneurs and average people, it's called the restaurant test. So what is the restaurant test? You take four people in a restaurant and you ask the first three people to order the same thing after, the, after the, that the fourth people choose something else in his mind. Average people will change their choice to the choice made by the first three because they, will not be, they don't want to be outliners. They will be like, yeah, I want the pasta. So a steak, a steak, a steak. Ah, okay, uh, yeah, give me a steak. And if you ask these people if they enjoy their meal or not, after being tricked like that, 95% of people will say, oh yeah, I should have taken the pasta. If you take entrepreneurs and do exactly the same experience, and I'm talking about successful entrepreneurs, and you take them, and you put 10 people that take something, and will be, yes, take, please. <laughs> because they are trained to never give a fuck of what others think. And if you look about how people deal with their life, it's always like that. For example, you ask people where they want to live. And they will say, 
oh, I want a neighborhood with a lot of shops and restaurants and, and, and a lot of life and families and young people. And after you tell them, are you rich or poor? So rich, they will go to live in west of Paris where there is nothing, and poor, they will live in east of Paris where there is that. But none of them will have chosen. Why? Because people don't go in six, 16 arrondissements or Chelsea in London or uh, up, um, Upper West Side in New York because they want to live there. It's because it's where people like them live, even if they are unhappy with that. Because most of the people, they don't want that kind of ambience around them. So what happened with entrepreneurship is that most of people don't realize that they have this dilemma to solve and they have to make a decision. So why I'm talking about that? I'm talking about that because everything I'm talking about in every session of Free Entrepreneur School and everything we do at the family is about glory. We don't care that people are happy and we don't care if our entrepreneurs are fine because that's the deal. But thanks to God, that's not a choice that everyone should make. Like, there is so many good opportunities to do a startup that don't grow like hell. I told you in a very manipulative way that startup equal growth. But startup that are growing equal growth. Like, some people can do service startup. Some people can be entrepreneurs in lifestyle business. Like, if you look at every lifestyle business entrepreneur, I know they are all happy. Most of the time, they are stupid and happy. It goes well together. Why? Because they do a nice living. They can do whatever they want. They have freedom. They have a lot of joy. Every pleasure they need is a pleasure they have. And they are never unsatisfied by what they are doing. Because they don't care about glory. Like, for example, I have a friend. He wrote a book about Evernote. And he sold seven millions of them. And every book is $10 online. I let you do the math. No one here knows him, and he will kill me if I give his name. Because he doesn't care. Like, <laughs> he did not do that book to become an archie millionaire. He did that book because he wanted to travel and go around the world and do kite surf and meet girls. Like, he needs nothing else in his life. So, think about that. Think about which kind of entrepreneurs you want to be and make a decision because the problem is a one way ticket. Because when you, if you want glory, it's really hard to come back to something simpler. Because we have egos, because we have psychological drama, because we are human and we don't, we don't like to say that we'll lose in a game. So this is why you should think about that and think about everything I told you until that moment that is half of the session. And, and think like, okay, that's fine. But all of that is true if you want to build a very big company. But if you just want to build a nice service business that makes a living, nothing I said apply. You can take the opposite of everything I said and it will work. Because if you want to do the happiness choice, there is thousands of things to do in, in, in our world. And by, by the way, if you choose a glory world and if you choose a glory path and you want to build that kind of startup, you should be paranoid and you should be aware that it will be hard. And it will be hard in a sense that you cannot realize because everything you will do can fail at any moment. Like, look Zenefit guy. You went from being no one to being one of the most successful entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley to be under federal investigation and maybe facing 10 years of jail. And 10 years of jail, not because you did something deeply wrong. No, 10 years of jail because you have a fucking monopoly around insurance that wants you dead. And because everyone around you in your team wants you dead too, because it's easier to get one killed than everyone, they will put you on the side and say, yeah, that's him. Uh, he's, he's, yeah, beat him. Go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so think about that. It's, it's, it's not an easy choice. And it's, it's not something you should take light. You should be very, very thoughtful about that. 
And if you want to take that path, and I think it's a great path to take, because the problem with happiness is that for a lot of people, the happiness path is boring. Like, for example, if you take someone like me, I, have, I own nothing, I don't like anything, uh, I, like sometimes I think like, yeah, if I was more rich, yeah, I will do the same. Like I, I don't see any influence on my life from money from a very long time. Because I can eat whatever I want to eat, and I can travel wherever I want to travel, and I can live wherever I want to live. So what do you want more? But some people, they have pleasure in that kind, you, you know, for, I have friends, they buy things, and they show you the things they buy. And, and me, if I can have less things, I'm happier. You know, every year I, I drop things, uh, you know, to the trash, or I give it. And I hate when people do me gift, <laughs> because after, you know, you're, you feel a bit complex to put it in the trash, uh, because it's a gift, but I hate that. Like, all my friends know that they should pay me experience, not gift. But again, I'm not saying that is universal. If anyone come and tell you that what he's saying is universal, or if anyone come and tell you that's the truth about entrepreneurship or startups or blah, 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 he's a liar. Because there is as much kind of entrepreneurs than there is a kind of path of life and ambition. And the kind of path of life and ambition that the family is talking about, it's it's exactly like if we, we can take a sport analogy, it works well. Let's, let's say you want to be an, a an, an Olympic champion. The kind of training you need will not be the kind of training you need if you want to do some sport to be healthy. And that will not be the kind of training you need if you are doing sport as leisure. You see, like you can be in leisure, it can be for good health, or it can be because you want to be a champion. And by the way, if I ask you the question, does sport is good for health or not? Everyone will tell me that sport is good. But the truth answer is, sport is good unless you are a top sport player. Because for every top sport player, sport is horrible. They get injuries, they got a level of, of burnout and, and physical level that it takes years to come back from. If, for example, I, I, was, I was in previous life dating someone that was an uh, opera dancer. You have to watch their feet to understand what pain means. Like, you have people that put themselves in a situation to give a performance for a few years in their life. They broke every single muscles and bones in their feet to, to, to a level that is... You, and they start that very young, by the way, because that's the only way to achieve greatness. So when, when you, you are with these kind of people, you understand that there is a price for that. And this is why everything we have around entrepreneurship is so depressing. Because we are living in a moment where because entrepreneurship is becoming fashionable, we tell you about all these glory stories with never telling you about the disclaimers that come down to and I think that here, a majority of people that wants to live that kind of entrepreneurship will never be able to suffer the kind of way you need to suffer to achieve that. And again, it's not a question of money. You know, by the way, if you are living in Silicon Valley and you want to be rich, you know what's the level of high net worth individual? $20 million. After $20 million on your bank account, there is no difference of a single dollar on your lifestyle. Because there is nothing you can buy. Like, of course, you can buy 10 cars because you are very rich. But at the end, you can use a car by one by one. So it's, it doesn't have a real influence. And by the way, if you have $20 million, you can rent any car you want. If you want to change car every day, you can buy a membership in a toy club and, and get car every day. So the high net worth individual level is $20 million in cash without the price of the house you live in. So $20 million in cash. What is the easiest way to get $20 million plus in Silicon Valley? It's not to create a startup. It's to be employee 20. Not even in the first employee. Because employee 20 
is a very strange statistical point because employee 20 is the first un people that get hired that is not a friend. Because most, in most startups, the first 10, 15, 20 people are friends. And 20 is a level of growth where you start to have companies that can hire people they don't know because they are growing that big. And employee 20 in Silicon Valley, in average, for an executive position, will do between 0.8% to 3% equity. And that level of amount of equity, if the startup is successful, is more than enough to do money. And by the way, employee 1,000, employee 1,000 at Facebook, did more money the day on IPO than 75% of the entrepreneurs that did an exit in Silicon Valley. I'm not talking about 75% of entrepreneurs that tried. I'm talking about the top 10% that did an exit. Employee 1,000. Do you think there is any glory about being employee 1,000 in a company? Like, it's random. Like, you, there was light and you go in. <laughs> and you wait and boom, there is an IPO and you get money. So, don't fool yourself about that kind of question. If you want to be an entrepreneur because you want to do money, do lifestyle business, do service company. That's where the, the, the money is. But if you want to do a company because you are looking for glory, Think about everything you learn here. Thank you. I didn't quite get the difference between optimization metrics and um, life metrics. Life metrics is there is only one, and in 99% of cases, revenue. So the life metrics show you if your company is alive or not. Optimization metrics is every metrics inside your flow that get you to the point of the life metric. So let's take an example. You are doing a social network, okay? So it's, it's a f f ex it's, everyone is using a social network, so it's kind of a universal example. So you first, your vanity metric will be acquisition of user. Uh, your first optimization metric will be how much of this user you acquire will be converted in register user. And the second optimization metric will be how, m how many percent of that user become, uh, for example, a daily active user. And the third optimization metric will be how many of this daily user will use how many percent of feature that are present on the website. And any feature that is not used should be deleted. Uh, by the way, we talk a lot in the product about what to add, but there is also a lot to, lot, lot to take off. And what will happen is that if you have all this process, you will have enough active users to sell ads. So you will have a second flow of optimization metrics will be how many advertisers I need to talk to, how much they are ready to pay by user, and how much they will convert. So all this optimization metric will create a cycle, user, advertiser, that end up in the life metrics. And it's doing boom, boom. Because it will be the revenue. So more you have user, easier you will be to have advertiser. More you have advertiser, less you will have user. So it creates a second tension that you cannot do anything. So you need to keep track of your metrics. And it will, it, it will generate revenue. Yeah. Every week. Every week. Every week. Because it's week of the week. You don't build an empire month of a month or year of a year. You do it week of the week. That's the only way to know if you are doing well or not. And what happens is that if your life, life metric is not growing week of the week, it means that something is broken in one of the flow. And so your job is to investigate what is broken. It's, it's a painful process. For, for example, I think one place where you want to go to work to learn that is Rocket Internet. I think the company that scaled that to a level is Rocket Internet. So Rocket Internet, for the people that don't know them, they copycat IDs and they just look at what works in Silicon Valley and replicate around the world. So they take out the ID generation part, but they keep the execution part. And inside the execution part, there is this question of, like, 
are we doing well or not? And because like what you will do is that you will look at KPI every day at Rocket. And if one day is not doing well, you will have the boss of Rocket that call you and say, why, 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 why? And you, you will answer questions during hours just, just with one guy that say, okay, but why? And, and it's, it's like if you want to investigate why something doesn't work in, inside your company, you should play that game. It's a very easy management game. You, you want that someone do his job better? Just ask why. Okay, you did that, why? He will give an answer and he will say why. And he will give an answer and he will say why. And he will reach a point where he will realize that something is broken or something is not working and you can take decision. So it's as easy as that. But again, you need violence. You, you need like intensity, you, it's, it's not a joke. If you look at startup as a family that works well, they are so intense. By the way, if you want to work to a startup, and you know, a lot of people ask us the question, is a startup good or bad? There is one single point to know if a startup is good or not. You go in the office and you feel the energy. Like, I know that you will not wait that answer from me, but it's true. Because in companies that are doing well, you feel that everyone is like violent and, and there is something happening. And by the way, every, like another clue will be to look at if the startup has bigger office than the team or not. Every good startup at the family is always late on the office side. Like for example, each, it's 35 employees in 80 meter square. Like, do you think we can work with 85, 35 people in 80 meter square? Of course not, but they do it very well. Like if you, we have a company that they had this brilliant idea, it's called, uh, uh, so they had standing desk, and behind the standing desk, there was a sitting desk on the other side, so they can save space. So on the same meter, you have one guy that was like that, and one guy was done, with an incredible view all day long. Like so, so but it's not it's not comfortable to do that. It doesn't look professional, but that's what makes startup incredible. It's because they are making things that they should not do. Uh, can you explain uh, more what the difference between uh, traction and growth? There is no difference. It's just another way to say growth. But I love the word traction because in English you understand traction because the idea of traction is that, you know, you get track, like that, traction. Uh, so it's the idea that growth is as much internal with your own effort than it's external in the sense that the market will take you with him. So that's why I love the word traction. But in French, people understand by traction the fact that it's going fast, but it's, it's a more subtle idea. That's why, that's why people use the word traction in English. Um, I, I wanted to, um, to talk about the vanity uh, metrics and um, optimization metrics. How can we um, measure ROI um, by measuring these metrics? Uh, so, uh, return on investment is the worst way to look at any metrics in your startup because return on investment is a benchmarking tool. Because what matters is not so much the return on investment and the level of return on investment. What matters is that you are growing and there is no price for that. So return on investment is a benchmarking tool because uh, let's talk about acquisition. Let's say you have 10 levels of acquisition and you will measure return on investment on every acquisition thing. Why you will do that? You will do that because you will say if return on investment is not high enough, I will kill them and if return on investment is high enough, I will do them. My stupid advice will be, as much as you can, just do them all because they will not bring you the same kind of growth and same kind of users. So that's why return on investment is a tool for very mature startup 
that start to optimize the way they do things. But at the beginning, you should not optimize things, you should just do it. And you should, you should just be aware that if you don't do everything, uh, you will end up doing nothing because you will be in, in a situation where you are not sure that what you are doing is, is hard enough. Of course, that doesn't come to say that you should do everything to a point where you are so unfocused that nothing brings any return on investment. But the return on investment part is quite tricky because it's not important at the beginning. What is important at the beginning is that your life metric is growing relatively in absolute number week over week. Everything else is not so, is not so important. Do you think that is good to um, measure the cost of acquisition for the start startups? Uh, so, if that translates in ROI as well. So uh, yes and no. Uh, that, that's also always the most horrible question because it's not universally true. It's not universally wrong. If you have a profitable business, the cost of acquisition doesn't matter. And if you have profitable unit economics, the cost of acquisition doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Because if you say, it cost me X, and I'm making Y, and Y is twice X, pff, nobody cares. But you will reach a point where you will start to need to create profit and optimize, and you will become a real company. And at that moment, cost of acquisition will be the most important thing. Because what will matter at that point will not be growth, but how much money you make. The problem with that is that we are entering a world where so many people have been so stupid about that, that everyone now is kind in a fear. Like if you look at the ambience in venture capital right now, everyone is going on hold and everyone's kind of scared. And I was reading this morning this article that say, yeah, growth at any price is not sustainable. Yeah, no kidding. Like, you mean that when you spend five times more than what you get, you end up bankrupt? Oh, thank you. That at least you did a Stanford MBA to discover that. So, like, of course, we are, we, we, we are building real companies. Of course, when I say, Cost of acquisition doesn't matter. I say cost of acquisition doesn't matter until it matters. Because of course you always reach a point where it's so obviously big that it doesn't make sense. But I see companies at the family that have stupid investors and they optimize cost of acquisition to make 10% more profit at the end of the year. And so they are losing growth. And that will be stupid. That will be stupid because they will not be at the level in term of market share we should be at the end of the year because they try to play small. So playing too big can be hurtful, playing too small can be hurtful. And so you need to, to be in a kind of middle. It's a, it's a so bad answer. Uh, <laughs> so at some point, founders deserve their equity. You know, when you take 30% of a company, it's because at certain point, you do things that no one can do. And, and understanding when you can play and when you cannot, and when you can push and when you cannot, that's the heart of entrepreneurship. That's not a science. That's where, as an entrepreneur, you need to learn do, to do things. And to give you a, a, a good image, it's exactly the same thing when, when you cook. You know, you have two kinds of people that cook. You have the recipe followers, that you know, measure everything, and they, they, they will be, you will tell them, yeah, put, a, put, a, put that amount of, of uh, chocolate and that amount of things, and blah, blah, blah. And they will follow the recipe, and you have people that feel it. I don't know any chef that don't feel it. I don't know any good chef that don't feel it. I know a lot of amateurs that follow recipes. But when you become an artist and when you become a great chef, you're like, yeah, phew, oh, um, yeah, a little bit more. And that's what makes incredible chef. Same thing with entrepreneurs. At the beginning, you try to play with rules. So, for example, I say to some entrepreneurs things stupid like, 
your acquisition cost should be a third of your revenue. Why a third? Because it looks good. A uh, third, yeah. It's two thirds that it can be used for something else, so that's not bad. But the best company at the family can have things like half or 10% or 95%, but they have their own logic, and you have an, an entrepreneur that deserves his equity. Because at the moment, it's your job to understand what you should do more or what you should do less. And by the way, there is no other way to learn that than try and be wrong and, and do mistakes. And you don't imagine like how many, like when I see only on the family how many mistakes I made with the entrepreneurs in two years, it's, 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 it's horrible because that's the only way to learn and of course it's scary, but you need to go over, overcome that. You have no other choice. I, I just wanted to go back to the difference between traction and growth. Because actually to my understanding, traction can actually come without revenue. Traction can be yeah. having a lot of users on a platform. So yeah, that's true. That's just, just making sure, my understanding is that you don't have such a, you don't really believe in companies that work on tracking a lot of users and monetizing it later. Though Facebook did it, but of course not of us are Facebook. Um, I don't know, what's your thought about so this? So my thought about that is again, that kind of subtle language difference are more confusing than bringing anything clear. Yeah, outside the language. Yeah, so outside the language, I don't believe that there is a thing that is called traction that is separate from growth because there is a rational link between growth and traction. And we, there is way too much vocabulary confusion. For example, you took Facebook as an example. Facebook is a social network with the biggest revenue gr growth ever from day one. The problem is that when you are doing 20 million revenue on second year and you spend 200 million in server cost, it doesn't seem that you are doing revenue growth and focusing on your revenue. Because of course, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, of everything you do as a company, revenue has a small part. But Facebook had business developer on day first and they had contract with advertising agency on the first, and they used that money like everything. And by the way, if you look at Facebook, the day they become cash positive, cash flow positive, was a celebration inside the company. Like it's one of the few milestones that have been celebrated internally and outside at some point like we became something self-sustainable, so now we can live forever. Because that's what it's about. So, Traction like, should always be linked at some point to your revenue strategy, even if you can be smart because you have capital. Even if you can become a small link instead of a big link because you have fundraising capabilities. So that's how you should manage it. But traction is really coming down to the fact that everything is growing so fast that the metrics and the numbers inside your company are amazing. That's what is traction about, is that you are different from everyone else because something that doesn't seem possible is happening. You seem to describe um, glory about being famous and I think maybe we can do something uh, great without no. being famous. famous? Sorry yeah, so, sorry for that because it's just a shortcut it's just, um, I think glory is about doing things that matters. That's what glory is about. And the definition of matters depends a lot from an industry to another industry. And, and doing things that matters is not being about mainstream famous. But at some point, if you do something that matters, you will always have a kind of a peer recognition of some, somehow. Look, Slack. Slack is killing email, changing the way we work, transforming uh, enterprise. But if you talk about Slack to your grandmother, she will have no clue of who the guy of doing Slack is. And I think here most of people use Slack and doesn't know the name of the founder. So there is a different, like when I talk about glory, I'm not talking about mainstream celebrity. I'm talking about the fact that you do something that matters 
so people recognize it as that. And for example, if I take my example back of, of writing a, a toolkit tips of Evernote, no one can recognize that as something glorious. Like it basically copy and past Evernote user manual, but a better design that he bought for two hundred dollars and sell it like hell. Like you can be impressed by the tricks, the tips, but no one will be like, oh my god, that guy matters. No, it will be like if if you are not nice, you will say you have been lucky. If you are nice, you will say he's smart, but you will never say it matters because it doesn't matter. Do you think it is a life choice, or we can say it for 10 years or something? Uh, good question, no idea. Yeah, sure. Uh, at, I see my life in act, and I think it... Look, we, we live... Now, in average here, people will live for 80 years, and some of us will reach maybe 120, 130. Like, that's the situation here. And we are still living in exactly the same way than when we was living 40 years. Uh, by the way, you want a crazy numbers? Someone that is 40 years old in 1950 was as old as someone that is 75 years old today in terms of body shape and in terms of energy and things like that. And now you have some people at 75 that are fucking active and that have so much energy in doing so much things. So you cannot still live that way. So that's why, uh, for example, I decided to see my life in, t in 10 years time period. You know, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50. And I, 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 I like to tell myself every 10 years, I will ask what will be my my view of that 10 years and my activity doesn't mean that I will do the same thing, but at least I will have the same goal. Uh, one last question. Uh, do you think founder need to agree on this and equity can oh, deal yeah. with this? Oh yeah, if, if founders are not aligned around that, you are going to a big mess. It's exactly like, I don't know, uh, I don't know what's important for people in life. Uh, let's say you are very, 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 very religious and you are dating someone that is not at all. Like, it will create trouble, for sure. I know, I know it, it will look politically correct to say that these people will live happy together, but it's bullshit. <laughs> or it means that the people that is religious is not serious about their religion. Like, yeah, that's, that's, that can be true too, but... Uh, or... I don't know, so, you know, there is things that are obvious, like uh, um, there is, like most of the, most of discrimination, most of the time we don't look at discrimination the right way, because we never understand the underlying message that there is be behind discrimination. This is why we are so bad at fighting discrimination. Like people see discrimination now as a moral stance, and it is, like they say it's bad, it's bad to discriminate, let's be diverse. And after when you want to be diverse, you understand every problem that it creates. But if you understand the underlining things behind, you will understand that it takes very a lot of hard work inside society to stop discrimination. Same thing with founders. Like you have to understand that there is a lot of underlining things that will push your company in a sense or another. And that is one of the most fundamental one. Because if someone wants happiness and the other one wants glory, it will not go very far. Yeah. You said that in 99% of the case, uh, your life metric is revenue. What's uh, 1%? <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no problem. Uh, the problem is that 1% is 1,000 Ks. So, so ve very easy. There is certain kind of companies that have such a product cycle that it makes impossible to sell anything. Uh, Tesla Motors. If Tesla Motors' life metric was revenue, they will have been dead for a long time. Why? Because it has been an R&D company for 10 years. 
And when you are an R&D company, your life metric, it's your capability to reach new milestone of R&D. So for Tesla, the life metric is, is it possible to build a car that drive on long distance with electrical battery? Is it possible to build electrical battery? Is it possible to build factories that make electrical battery or commodities, blah, blah, blah. So the one person case, so my advice very often is never do that kind of company as a first time startup. You have to be smart about that. You have to understand that as an entrepreneur, you have a curriculum like any employee. And your job is to write that curriculum. Elon Musk will never have been Elon Musk starting to be Elon Musk. Like he did the first company that got sold for 200 million, a second one that got sold for 1.6 billion, and then it became Elon Musk. Like if you're, there is a very good book about that. Uh, it's a book that made me an entrepreneur. Uh, it's, a, it's a science fiction book. It's called The Man That Wants to Sail the Moon. And it's a funny story because the first chapter starts as a guy that explained to his wife that he sold everything he has because he, he achieved his lifetime goal. And the wife is, so, is in shock. She's like, did you sold our house in Lacombe? He's like, yeah, I sold it. And did you sold your factory? Yeah, I sold it. And the restaurant business? Yeah, I sold it. And everything? Yeah, I sold it. And by the way, you know the med? I fire her because I don't have any, enough money to pay the med anymore. And the wife is like, but what are you saying? You are saying that I will do the cleaning myself? So yeah, because we are out of money. But what the fuck did you do with the money? I bought the moon. Because his goal was to build a city on moon and he, that was a kind of a lifetime goal, and he did everything in his life with only that goal in mind. And after the book come back 30 years, uh, um, 30 years back, and he's a small employee in a company, and he's convincing his boss to open his first venture and to fi to finance his venture. And after you follow him all the way long until the day he, he, you go back to chapter one. And after every other book is about how he built the moon. And that's the book that inspired Elon Musk too. Like he's told in an interview that it's a book, it's a Robert, and Robert Heinlein, I think, the, the author. Uh, but it's a man that wanted to sell the moon. And it's, it's really show like how being ambitious, you need a step-by-step -step plan. Because you cannot come and say, I want a billion dollar to do a, a something impossible. You need to build track record, personal track record first to achieve that. So I think people overestimate that. And I, I think people don't try to get quick win at, as, as entrepreneur. Like if you, it's your first time thing, just do a quick win. Just do something that builds your curriculum. And if it's not a lifetime thing, just sell it. Or You know, some people are asking themselves, should I sell or should I not sell? So the question is, are you doing something that is your life or not? If it's not your life, just sell and do something else. <laughs> because you, you don't know what will happen. And at least you build a track record. And if you look at the game you are playing, it's a very funny game. Because on 100%, so 100 entrepreneurs, you will have 15 of them that will raise money with Angel. On that, you will have five of them that will raise money with VC. And on that, you will have between one to two, depending if it's a good year or bad year, that will sell their company. So it shows you how to build your curriculum. Like, are you doing something with enough traction? Are you VC-backed? And, and it's like being in a sport team. If you have an index as a backer, you will not be perceived the same way than if you have a... Uh, uh, Regional de Provence Côte d'Azur. Uh, like you can fundraise exactly the same amount, you will not have the same curriculum. One million with index is not the same curriculum as an entrepreneur than one million with a random guy that put money in a random regional company. Last question. That was the last question. Thank you. I'm
Peace.